other kid coming out the hood, trying to chase your dreams, trying to, you know, make it to the league or whatever. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go play rugby. Yeah. I can go to England, Australia, whatever. And I had tore my meniscus and MCL in 2017. Mm. So I missed a whole season after that. I'm like, all right, I need something to do. I was in my last year of college. Let me get my degree. I went to John Jay College, so not too far from here. Okay. Um, got my degree in law and society. And then I just decided to do an internship up in uh, the New York State Assembly. Just needed, honestly, I just needed like six more credits, get my degree and get out. But then when I went up there, I'm like, yo, this is wild. There's so many things that people back on the block that don't know what, you know, how this works. Mm-hmm. And that we're constantly like poor black and brown people constantly left outside of the democratic process. And we could change all that, but no one's listening to us. And what can we do to change it? We need to like mass mobilize people to come together and like take on the establishment, right? Right, yeah. So when I got back, and it was like crazy timing, man. AOC just came up right on the scene. Yeah. You know? And the wild part was that a friend of mine, actually, she worked with Alex. Um, I call her Alex, but AOC. Yeah. Uh, at the restaurant that she was working at. I kept them back in my head for a while. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, if I need to help out, whatever. I, you know, I'll get on board when I can. And then when I actually saw her on the Young Turks one time, I'm like, yo, she's, like, talking that talk. Like, yeah. I, I, had, she's dope. I, I yeah. had to. I had to. You know? So got on board on her campaign. Started out as a volunteer, and then they just needed someone to be with her at all times, so I happened to have a car. And they're like, yo, Sean, just pick her up in the Bronx, go wherever you need to go, bring her back home, and it was just a repeat every, every day. Um, you know, but I got so much advice from her. I got to see what it's like being a candidate firsthand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an emotional roller coaster, spiritually, emotionally, physically, too. Yo, I haven't hit the gym like in a week, and I'm like stressed <laughs> about that, man. Word. I know that feeling. Stress. Yo, when yeah. You're, you know? Where you're so busy, it is hard to get to the gym. How, how much of seeing her, because, you know, I think a lot of people from New York City, a lot of black and brown people, were inspired by what you saw her do in the Bronx and yeah. still inspired by what she's yeah. doing right now, right? Like, so seeing that close up every day, mm-hmm. did that kind of plant the seed then to say, yo, I could do this too? Uh, probably not. Huh, okay. <laughs> okay. Probably not. For me, I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do yet. You know, I'm, I'm still, like, at the time at least, still in my mid-20s trying to figure life out like anybody else. Yeah. And I, I figured, you know what, actually around this time last year, I was about to apply to law school. Huh. You know? Mm. I was probably going to, I was thinking about going to law school or maybe even becoming a teacher, trying to figure things out. But then what clicked for me was actually went down to Tijuana at the, uh, in December 2018. So, you know, being a veteran... You saw what Trump was doing. He was sending down the military down there at the border. And it's like the San Diego border, the Texas border. So I got together with, like, other veteran organizers and other organizers who worked on AOC's campaign. We we're like, yo, we got to do something about this. We have to be in the opposition, right, just to demilitarize the, the border. So we went down there to help all these asylum seekers, to help these people who are just escaping government persecution, poverty, you name it. And if you think about it, yo, it's our country, our government. We set the stone for the environment down there for like the last century, essentially, mm-hmm. right? Right, right? And it's been a repeat, even with the the war on drugs and everything. People are continuing to flee the countries because of what we created. So when you have like mothers and children coming up to the border, and these are like mass majority of them are mother and children, they should tell you something's wrong. There's something wrong here. So when I got back, I'm like, all right, well, my Congress member. And he represents the most diverse borough in the world. He sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He could do something about this, have a stronger stance on immigration. Mm. New York 5 had a 70% uh, ratio of people of uh, people coming from immigrant families. You right. know, So it's vast majority of black and brown people, 50% blacks, 20% Latinos, 20% South Asians. Mm. We make up it. We yeah. make up diversity of queens, right? Yeah. So I'm like, all right, Gregory Meeks, you know, can we make sure that people uh, are, you know, are getting fed? Making sure that they're getting health care. Making sure that their human rights are being violated. Making sure that the asylum cases are being processed. He undermined all that. Was like, you know what? We just need to create more bed space for them in these detention centers. I'm like, that doesn't solve. Bro, problem. I'm right. like, and then the light bulb click. You were like, I need to go against this guy. <laughs> That's when I started ticking because I was just pissed off at this point, bro. I'm like, yo, yo. Yeah, I'm tell- yo, but Dex, what do I always <sighs> say? Sometimes you just got to get pissed off well, and then well, things listen, are going to change. Listen, ang- anger, <laughs> I always say this to them too, right? Like, it's not that anger is ever wrong, right? It's, it's what you do with that anger, yeah. right? And how you channel that. And it sounds like you channel that into something positive to actually try to have some change because mm-hmm. what I find interesting in you telling that story, right, is like you got people together to go see what you could do. Right. Then you came back home and was like, hey, what can we do back home? Right. And 
you kind of saw people was like, yeah, I kind of really don't care about this. We're just kind of going to push this to the side. Yeah. But you didn't give up. Nah. Right? You kept going. And you figured that, oh, there's something that I can do about this. So how did you get to that process where you were, okay, you, he says that, you sort of receive it the way you receive it, and then you go from there to, you know what, I'm going to take this on and I'm going to try to change this myself. Yeah, I mean, it was a day-by-day kind of thinking process. Like, I had to do more research before I even decided on doing this. You know, I had to make sure that, one, this is, don't get me wrong, like, he's been there for 20 years, so he has clout. He has money. He has mm-hmm. the power of the establishment, so I had to be careful. I want to make sure that if I do this, like I got to do it the right way. Sure. I have no money whatsoever. I started this campaign like zero bucks. Yeah. You know? So I'm like, all right, let me see if there's anyone else maybe out there thinking about running. Maybe I could support them. Um, let's play it out. Waited for a while. Nothing. Um, and then I do more research on this guy. I'm like, yo, there's more to this. Oh. There's more to this, right? <laughs> yeah. And the biggest thing that stuck out is that the voter turnout in this district is 3%. 3% huh. is very, very low. So he's been let, – let's also, let's also be, to be clear for the people, um, your opponent, who you'll see in the primary, he's been there for 21 years. 21 um, years. The voter turnout, like you said, is 3%. This mm-hmm. is the New York 5 district. This is South Queens, Nassau, part of uh, east, western part of Long Island. Um it kind of sounds to me when you say that with the voter turnout being three percent. It's like, yeah, he's been skating on? by, or he's been skating by because low voter voter turnout. Know who he's going to get, mm-hmm. so he's going to get the same people yeah. voting for him all the time and just yeah. gets reelected. And there's yeah. really not been a serious challenge. I take it that you feel that you are that serious challenge. Yeah, I feel good about it. I mean, the people on the streets feel good about it. Like we've been able. There to, you like, go. That's what matters. You people know, on the streets. no, that's but, what matters. but no, that's, it's, matters. that's real though. No, that's no, real. I'm being serious because if, if I had to think about okay, what's making up the three percent of the voter turnout? I don't think they're going to be like okay. We talked about Bernie Sanders for a little bit before this podcast, and Bernie Sanders, he's big on people of our generation, Sean. Yeah. You know, the millennials, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Is Gregory Meeks targeting those people? Yeah, did you I find don't that, think that he is look, at yeah, all. You, you know what I mean? Numbers, like, did you find it? Yeah, did you? Is he targeting those people, or did you find out that the vote? What did you find out from looking at that three percent? I assumed you looked deeper into it. What did you find out? So what I started finding out, all right, where is his voting base? Right. Mm-hmm. So I started finding out. All right, well, it's definitely like these local Democratic clubs where you know I'm not trying to be an ageist or anything, but most of them are are old folks, are our yeah. aunties and uncles, right. are, are our parents. That's how these things go. <laughs> and it's literally the same meeting every month and talking about the same thing that lasts for three, four hours. I'm like, mm-hmm. yo, a lot of young people don't have time for this. That's why we don't show up. Right. You know? And then they expect us to go there and just listen to them. Yeah. Keep things the way the way that they are. But it's like we keep the thing the you know same things that the way they are and it's killing us. Yes. Literally, it's killing us. I mean, th- that locally and then nationally, you yeah. could you could do that in anything. And, then, about... and when we think about, like, young people not wanting to be involved in politics, it's because of, like, how much everything that has, like, harmed us, we hate the, the system in itself, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's right. a lot of, like, voting apathy. Yeah. So when, like, I live in the 40 Project in South Jamaica. When I tell people where I, where I live, bro, they're like... All right, I got you. 40, yeah, you I want, got you. Forty P. Forty P is real. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, I know yeah, that. yeah. Forty P is real. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, and let's, I'm going to bring it back to something here. We all we spoke about this off camera and and off the pod. All of us sitting here are children of immigrant parents. Yeah. Um, we all have grown up in communities where there's been a ton of people like us, yeah. black and brown, Latino folks. Yeah. Um, to to see that, I think you talked about people being desensitized with politics and sort of having the apathy towards it. I was at that place at one point, right? Oh, Where it was yeah, just like, sure. ah, yeah, I, I, I don't care. I'm a little bit more hopeful for certain things because of the diversity we're seeing, because we're seeing AOC, because we're seeing more women uh, get get in places in, in politics that we can see it visible nationally. Mm-hmm. Um, how Could you talk about how important it is to have that diversity so we can see black and brown and Latino folks representing, knowing the needs of their community and actually fighting for those needs. Yeah. I mean, the representation is important, but, you know, there's a slang that goes like, not all skin folk are kin folk, right? So Amen to that. It's like, <laughs> uh-huh. if, if, if the values of what you're trying to represent for your community doesn't really reflect it, then there is no point of you being there. None. Right. Period. Yeah. Right? Period. Yeah. So when I look at Gregory Meeks, I'm like, bro, you've been there for 20 years. You have no business being congressman right now. Like, you could be a lobbyist, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. But when you're talking about 
the amount of home for like we have a housing crisis in New York Five. The amount of home foreclosures that's been going on over there in Queens has been devastating. Twenty mm-hmm. nineteen, we lost three hundred and twenty homes, and the most people that are affected by it were people from like St. Albans, Cambria Heights, Springfield mm-hmm. Gardens. This is all New York Five. Wow, it's crazy. And then you got to look at the bigger picture. It's not him, not only him. He's just enabling a system, and like he's getting, he's taking money. He takes two million dollars per cycle from Wall Street. And these are like big banks, payday lenders who do everything they can to ensure that they lobby him so he could vote on legislation that will deregulate big banks, payday lenders who have no interest in like working people and like our well-being. They have an interest in making money. 